Well, hi, Dan. Um, back chatting this week. Uh, you um, you wrote this week um, about um, another uh, project that uh, council was was asked to, um, I guess, walk back um, some of their amenity requests, at least delay them. So what's uh, what what's happening? What's happening there? Yeah, so this was about uh, this is one specific real estate development, but it's a really, really big one. I think it's 15 or 1600 um, homes and uh, it's the it's the former Oak Ridge Transit Center. So it was a bus depot near 41st and between Oak and Canby. And um, it's a big, huge site. Uh, it was bought several years ago by a partnership between uh, developers Intergolf and Modern Green. They bought it from TransLink for $440 million, which made it at the time one of BC's largest ever real estate transactions. Uh, and then those you know, original owners got it through the rezoning process uh, about four years ago now. So Vancouver's previous city council approved this rezoning. It was a big, huge master plan community, commercial space, childcare, uh, market rental housing, market condos, non-market housing, some social housing, a big two acre public park. It was a big hole. I mean, I remember at the time, Vancouver's previous council was quite excited about it. But then thing is not much happened in the years after that. And about two years ago, uh, Grosvenor, a big major developer, bought the site uh, from Modern Green. And so they're the ones moving it ahead now. So basically what happened is that this week they came to council and they had approached City Hall at, at some point saying that the timelines uh, for the project that were contemplated in the original rezoning approval a few year, four years ago, these timelines were not feasible now. They could not move this thing forward fast enough to hit these timelines. And so they were asking basically for an extension for five years uh, to extend the whole thing. There, and so staff were recommending that council should, it was reasonable for council to grant this extension. Um, and there was a bunch of concern. I wasn't sure, you know, what would happen on council if they would just kind of approve it. Yeah, say, yeah, sure, no problem. But a lot of councillors raised questions and a lot of them had concerns. And um, they were kind of worried. And there was some worry about what exactly it meant they were trying to clarify, does this mean that the developer wants to delay delivering the social housing or delay delivering the other public amenities in favor of forging ahead with building the condos first or whatever? That wasn't the case. And um, okay. as you know, city staff explained and the developer explained in council, a representative from the developer, uh, they, they were not changing the sequence. They were still going to be moving forward with delivering the social housing and stuff in the same order they always were going to, they were just gonna to have to delay everything. They were saying that there was, you know, remediation work to do on the site and the timelines just weren't doable. There was some pushback from counselors who said, well, presumably when Grosvenor bought this property two years ago, they were aware of what the agreements were, what the timelines were. It wasn't a secret at that time. It was public to anybody who wanted to know what the timelines were. Um, but so effectively, yeah, Grosvenor and, City staff were saying that they're they're just proposing it's going to need more time. It's not possible, physically possible, to do this in the time frame that's currently contemplated. And so, city staff made the case that this is a, a pretty unique situation, largely because of the change of ownership, right? Um, so they, you know, city staff in the report to council cited three different reasons for the delays. They said, you know, basically the original owner didn't do very much to move the thing forward in the first couple of years after they got the re the approval, then there was a change of ownership. And then they also mentioned sort of current economic conditions. So obviously the first two things are kind of unique to this project. The third one right, is something right. that's affecting everybody. And obviously this is interesting in the context of we're hearing about a lot of development projects either being delayed or at risk of being canceled or shelved for an extended period of time. Uh, a bunch of developers are saying, you know, both in communications to Metro Vancouver and to regional, you know, regional governments, municipal governments, provincial governments. And they're saying it publicly that these current market conditions just mean that a lot of projects can't move ahead um, or they're going to be delayed for a while. Um, and so that's something we keep hearing about the homeowner, the sort of the Home Builders Association of Vancouver has said that they're hearing about 
you know, tens of thousands of units of housing that have been approved by municipalities in Metro Vancouver, but they haven't pulled building permits yet just because it's not viable for these projects to move forward. So, so what's it going to take? Like, are you getting any sense from the cities or from, because obviously we near, we near, need housing. There's like a huge pent up demand for housing. What's it going to take to unlock this gridlock? Well, it's kind of a, the, the builders, at least, what they say, the developers, um, they're blaming a bunch of different things. Obviously, as we know recently, a kind of coalition of different major developers made a plea to Metro Vancouver saying that the they, because Metro was considering big increases to their development fees, really big increases, and saying they were kind of making the case to delay the implementation of these fees because these fee, fee increases on their own were going to make some projects not viable. And there was a pretty split uh, view among Metro Vancouver's board of directors, like which are all, you know, locally elected mayors and councillors from the region. Uh, we've heard different views from them on this subject. Some of them are saying, no, these developers just want to make bigger profit margins. Um, and some of them are saying, we're worried that the, this is going to make projects not viable and that projects just won't get built. Um, so there, there's that that's a factor, or at least builders are saying that's a factor. These, um, you know, if you triple the development fees per unit and you've got a thousand unit development or a 2000 unit development, obviously it makes a pretty big difference for the, for the pro forma. That's what the developers are saying. Then obviously there's also things like interest rates and the availability of capital, uh, way outside the control of any municipal government or a regional government or a provincial government, right? They can't control interest rates. You know, David Eby, BC NDP leader, had had often, you know, said that he would like to see interest rates come down, but, you know, it's not something he can control. The cost of materials has gone way, way up. I mean, I think it's in some cases has moderated a bit, but it's a huge factor. It's a very tight labor market. You know, we're hearing a lot of skilled trades. A lot of people are retiring. Not as many people are coming up. So the availability of skilled trades to actually build the homes. So there's, it's just, it sounds like it's a tight market right now. And I mean, you know, obviously in the past, one of the things builders and, you know, the industry and the development lobbying, uh, development lobbyists would kind of argue that municipalities, city halls, and are kind of restrict, they're not approving enough housing or they're taking too long to approve it or they're, you know, beholden to NIMBY neighborhood associations and they're not getting stuff approved. And that was often something that we heard about. Even, you know, provincial politicians would sort of say that municipalities are responsible for holding up or they're to blame for holding up a lot of housing. But obviously in some of these cases, we've got projects, big, huge projects, many projects that have been approved by city halls. And I mean, in this Grosvenor example, you've got them actually coming to city hall saying, hey, this thing you approved four years ago like you've already approved it, but can we actually take longer to deliver it? We 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 can't deliver it as fast. So it's not to blame the developers, but it's just to show that city halls are not always necessarily the bottleneck that's slowing these things down. There's a million factors, right. and and a lot of them are not out. Of, they're out of control of any one entity. And depending on where you live in the region, you might be surprised to hear that there's a slowdown because you can look out your window in some places and see lots of cranes and buildings yeah. going up from Surrey City Centre to Brentwood to parts of Vancouver. Oh, but yeah. I think you, you've talked about in the past, like a lot of these projects were started in a different economic environment and yeah. they're finishing. It's more a matter of, are there new holes going in the ground yes. for, for new projects? But even the hole, even if a new hole goes in the ground next week, that project might have been, you know, mapped out a decade ago or half a decade ago or something, right. in a different environment. Uh, there's kind of these lagging indicators. By the time a, a hole is in the ground or crane is up or whatever, this project was started a long, long time ago with math that was done in a different environment. Uh, one of the indicators that you and I can't see driving around our communities or walking around the downtowns, uh, we can't see the volume of land sales. And that's something that has plummeted. So that's one of these things that people in the industry, they're getting monthly charts, maybe we, maybe more frequently, they're getting these charts showing how much, how many land deals are happening, um, which are kind of the prelude to big developments happening, right? Before, long before a developer approaches City Hall, you know, even longer before it goes to a public hearing and the neighbors show up to oppose or, or support it, 
uh, there's these deals happening where people are buying and assembling big parcels of land. Um, and that has to happen a long time before anything becomes public, before a development application sign goes up in front of the property. Anyway, those have plummeted in recent months. And we've written about this before. There's there's way, way fewer land sales happening. It's There's been a precipitous decline in those. And so that kind of that's happening now. We can't see that with our eyes walking around town. But there are these charts that people in the industry are looking at and saying, oh, this looks pretty bad. And so in theory, unless something changes, what that might mean is that five years from now, we're not going to see new holes getting dug in the ground, new cranes going up. But obviously, things can change pretty fast in this industry. Right. Things could get fast tracked. But then you would also run into that challenge that you mentioned earlier about labor right. supply. If suddenly yeah. everybody decided they wanted to turn on the faucet at the same time, it's not going to be possible. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And obviously, there are different things that the federal government, provincial government, you know, they're, they're doing things to try to address the shortage of labor, trying to train up more people. These are good, these are good jobs. And uh, whether it's training up local people, bringing in skilled people, you know, from elsewhere, uh, it's something they're trying to address, but it's, it's, it's an issue. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not an issue that you can kind of fix in a week or two. Right. Right. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Great. We'll chat again next week.